She is dressed to go out, garbed in Filipiniana formal wear, her hair tied neatly into a bun. But she seems to have been caught in a private moment, her face averted, cast in shadow, refusing to look back and be looked at. Her arms circle her waist like a protective barrier, drawing an imaginary line that says, Okay, you can view me, but keep your distance, please. At the same time, those same arms invite me to cross that barrier and take the line for a walk. As a famous modern artist, Paul Clay puts it, acutely aware that I'm intruding, even if I know that this portrait, alongside others done by major artists, is in a space meant to be viewed in public. With much reluctance, I zoom in upwards to the landscape of creases on the fabric of the dress, on to the collarbone, which, together with the outward tilt of the butterfly sleeves, act like a frame that quickly leads to the downward off-center gaze of the face. She looks distracted, thinking of something else, a secret thought. What could she be thinking? I have never met Purita Kalao Ledesma, the subject of this portrait. The little I know is pieced together from writings about her and her own writings. And even if I had met her and interviewed her, I would have hesitated to ask such a prying question. She might have been surrounded by many people with whom she interacted in her most polite manner, while at the same time, she was disrupting and interrupting many ways of doing and thinking about art. She must have a lot going on, and this is very much evident in her countenance and her pose. From the vantage point provided by photos sent to me by the organizers, I see a lifelike torso rendered in terracotta from the lower hips up. This is a convention with busts. Historical figures and leaders are mostly shown from just beneath the shoulder up, most of them frontally, their faces impassive. This portrait by Julie Luch shows most of the upper body. The work is dated 1995, so the subject must have been in her 80s at that time. Her hands are clasped loosely together, palms and fingers facing each other, a standard position for portraits of well-bred ladies who were taught to sit properly. I could almost hear the words of my mama, titas, and lolas. Don't sit stiffly with feet and knees in the center. You look like a frightened child, and you are no longer a child. Don't sit splayed and occupy too much space. You look like a man. Keep your knees together, otherwise your privates will show. Don't fidget with your hands. Don't smooth your skirt, play with your jewelry, touch your face, or fuss with your hair. Keep your hands relaxed and still. Avoid clenching, scratching, and twiddling. Avoid slouching. Sit up straight, no matter what you are sitting on. This portrait of Kalo Lidesma is certifiably compliant. We deduce that she is modest, polite, and self-effacing. But from various other sources, we know she's anything but compliant. She is a pioneer, a compassionate one. She helped many artists, even raising all sorts of funds to send a few to school. Many of these artists went on to become major artists, whose works broke conventions by working on styles inherited from modern art, which was vogue in 20th century Europe and America. When it was introduced to the Philippines through a show held in the 1920s by Victorio Edades, who was then newly returned from his studies in the United States, modern art was initially received by a shocked and reluctant public. But this lady was undaunted and was very much pivotal in breaking down such barriers. Path clearer, groundbreaker, prim and proper, 
befitting her station and her class. That much I can gather from the flat computer screen, zooming in and zooming out of the visual and written clues yielded by photos and powered by unstable internet. But many things remain unclear while I scan these clues. Is she sitting or standing? One elbow rests on something that I cannot identify, no matter how hard I try to magnify that part. Perhaps it would have helped if I knew where the sitting took place. In the artist's studio, in which case a freestanding pedestal might have been handy. In the sitter's home, in which case the prop might be a favorite chair or a favorite part of the house, like a staircase. It's a pity that I cannot meet his sculpture face to face, move around it, look closely, and view it in context. Sculpture, unlike painting, does not normally carry its frame with it. A painting is flat, and we view it from a fixed frontal position. A sculpture in the round moves into a site, takes up its space, obtrudes it, and changes it. To borrow from W.J.T. Mitchell, who asked the famous question, what does the picture want? As the sculpture takes its place in a location or station, it demands to be seen, felt, held, beheld, and encountered by other bodies in that space. But since such an encounter is not feasible in these extraordinary times of quarantine, I have to make do with a few tentative conclusions. The lady may be seated or standing. One shoulder is slightly twisted and slightly tilted to one side, with the head facing the opposite direction, gazing downwards, very similar to a yoga pose designed to give more flexibility to the spine. The sitter is slender enough for the collarbones to be visible as she executes this twist. I tried this pose in front of the mirror, but my collarbones were nowhere to be seen, probably because I am more fleshy. To sustain that pose, I had to focus on my breath. Otherwise, I will get distracted. This brings me to another set of questions. How is it like to sit or stand for a sculpture and sustain this pose? How did the artist and sitter arrive at this pose? Did they discuss and plan it? Or did they go through many trials and errors? How many sessions did it take for Kalo Lidesma to sit for Julie Luch? And while the sitting was in session, did they talk? Or did they work together in comfortable silence? If they did talk, what did the two accomplished women talk about? I would have loved to be part of these sessions, keeping a low profile like a fly in the wall, making sure that I do not disrupt the flow of creative juices, but silently observing, listening, and taking down notes. But from where I sit now, the words of the feminist critic and literary scholar Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak becomes vividly felt and uncomfortably resonant. The globe is in our computers. No one lives there, she says. The global view is aerial, high above the earth. We see images from a distance, brought to us by screens and pixels via satellite and transmission towers. What I attempted here is to interrupt the aerial view and talk to the sculpture. Echoing Michelle, I do not ask, what are you about or what do you mean? But what do you want and how did you come about? What do you want to tell? What stories do you want me to tell? I try to tell one such story by summoning memories, at times daydreaming, speculating, musing, imagining, wishing, and yes, asking questions in an effort to cross the barrier, bridge the gap, and close the distance between our bodies, our stories, our lives. How about you? What is your story? <laughs>